So it's, it's my pleasure to introduce the first invited speaker, Martin Rump, who is a professor of mathematics at, at Bonn University. And he's been there, well, in his current position since 2004. Um, he was originally at Bonn. He studied math and computer science, graduating in 1992. And after that, he became a postdoc at Freiburg University and went to Bonn as an associate professor afterwards. Um, after leaving for a bit, he's back at Bonn now. And he's interested in, in mathematical modeling, analysis, numerical computing with applications to material science, uh, image processing, and computer vision. And today he's going to be talking about ge uh, geometry processing in shape spaces. So with that, I'll introduce Martin. me uh, to give this presentation. Thanks a lot for the invitation. So uh, this is meant to be uh, a lecture for, for our audience, uh, but this is a mathemat mathematician's perspective. So uh, this, uh, you might see it as a warning. Please interrupt me if I uh, should explain something in addition. And uh, the topic is uh, geometry processing, but not processing uh, single geometries, uh, but really processing geometries, images, in the space of geometries, in the space of images. I will develop some theory, in particular I would like to present uh, an effective uh, discretization of geometric calculus on shape spaces and apply it to different shape spaces, uh, as you will see soon. So this is based on joint work with uh, a couple of people. The very early start was with uh, Leah Barr and Guillermo Sapiro uh, on uh, discrete geodesics in the space of objects. Uh, Benjamin Berkels is one of my PhD students and now professor at Aachen. Alexander Effland is still with me as a PhD student. Bill Bert Heron will give a talk in the SGP meeting this week. Uh, this is also joint work, in particular, uh, if it comes to the space of shells, viscous shells, with uh, Peter Schroeder, Mike Spadetsky, and uh, I have a very long-standing cooperation on all this uh, with Ben Lindbergh, who is now professor at, uh, at Münster. So here's a very brief overview. So first of all, I would like to start with very basic things. What is a metric? Uh, what is a manifold? We will start with a toy model, then we will come to infinite dimensional manifolds. And I will give some examples on remaining shape spaces. Then we will talk about shortest paths, maybe geodesics, and how to discretize them. And then we will think about different applications. Uh, path extrapolation via the exponential map, particularly by a discrete exponential map transfer of geometric variations via parallel transport, then more an announcement uh, uh, for something that here we present this week is uh, splines in shape space. And finally, I would like at least to give some remarks on the uh, uh, hard facts on rigorous mathematical results in all this theory. So here's a teaser, some motivation. So we now think of uh, all these uh, blobs being objects there, what we actually see is um, red blood cells and the white blood cell here hunting little bacteria. And these are two frames from an image sequence. They are, as you see, uh, quite far apart in time, so there is substantial nonlinear deformation needed to get from here to there. And how to do this tribulation in a smart way. And you can do it with the uh, shape space technology if uh, on the space, in this case, of uh, viscous objects, which is a proper model, in particular for this type of application, between, uh, be because there is a lot of liquid, the cells are filled with liquid of different viscosities, so this can nicely be modeled. And you see here how these objects deform. This is what we will later call a discrete geodesic. And then by push forward or pull back, you can uh, transfer the texture over the whole sequence. 
we can also do is uh, motion extrapolation. So here are two poses with a very slight geometric variation. And then uh, one can extrapolate the motion coded in, this, uh, in these two input images. And uh, finally, this is Benedict here running and uh, finally um, use this uh, as uh, uh, an extrapolation of uh, the very start of this, uh, this motion and use texture push forward to, to fill this with color. So this is just for objects, viscous objects. There is no texture or uh, image intensity so far. Here you see now a blending of one Van Gogh portrait to another one via a discrete geodesic in the space of images. And we'll, I will also explain how to do this. And uh, you can do also different things uh, uh, like uh, pulling back uh, uh, this uh, geometry onto, onto this geometry here and using the texture uh, from up there. What we can also do is uh, paratransport. Here is uh, to transfer uh, geometric details. So what you see here is uh, what we've done a couple of years ago. Um, here is uh, a neutral face. Here is the transition by a short discrete geodesic uh, to a discussed face. Here is now a smile. And we can transport the smile along the sequence, uh, ending up uh, with the facial expression which is a smile with a frown. OK, let's start very slowly with the, the very basic facts. We think of uh, an embedded surface, like this pretzel here. We think of a parameter domain. We look for curves, which live down here. Then, via the parameterization, they are mapped up there. Uh, there is a velocity of this curve. This is this vector red vector here. By the chain rule, we get the corresponding velocity on the, um, on the surface. <clears throat> and then we can compute the length of this path here, just by integrating uh, this expression here, the um, velocity up here, the norm of this velocity integrated in time. And we will suppose through the talk that time basically runs always from 0 to 1. This is the length. Now you all know that you can transform it just by using the transpose of this. Then we get here a quadratic form with this matrix here, which basically encodes what the parameterization does with the velocity field here. And uh, we denote this matrix on the corresponding quadratic form, G. And this is the metric on uh, this embedded uh, surface uh, expressed on the parameter domain. Ah, so the metric is just a quadratic form, which is positive definite, and uh, that's all, and symmetric. So this is not fixed to finite dimensions. And we can basically throw away this embedded surface and think of uh, a manifold M just by prescribing this metric G. And then we can define, as before, using this, this protective form, the length of a curve on the manifold. Huh? Just imposing that this G is positive, definite, and symmetric. And then we have a remaining distance between the starting position here and the end position, Y_a and Y_b. This is just the minimal length or if we minimize overall paths which connect these two points here. Huh? That's the remaining distance. But there is not only remaining distance. As we will see, it's much more practical to work with the path energy. Ah, so the length is here, this object. And the path energy is just without the square. The difficulty with the length is, which at first appears to be a nice property, that it is uh, parameterization invariant, reparameterization invariant. But this is a serious problem if we want to do things, if we want to go for existence or deal with this mathematically. It's much more practical to use the path energy. 
And uh, there's a very simple observation. If we start with a path length, now uh, this is a path length, we insert here just the one, and then we have an integral over two factors, the one and the square root, and this is a scalar product. We can use Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. Uh, the scalar product can be estimated by the norm of the two objects. But this object is here one, so what we see is that the length can be estimated uh, from above by the square root of the path energy. Uh, this is one of the fundamental facts of, the, of geometry. And even more, we know that here equality holds if these two objects which we have in here are linear dependent. What does this mean? These are functions over the interval 0, 1. Linear dependence means now, what is linear dependent to a constant? It's another constant. So that means equality holds only if this object is constant. That means if we have um, uniform speed with which the curve is traversed. Speed measured in terms of the metric. Now, so that means there is equality and the length is equal to the square root of the energy if we are in an I can parametrized minimizer. And uh, so, and now we can reformulate the remaining distance just at the square root of the minimizer of the energy here with these initial conditions, uh, boundary conditions yA and yB, and minimizing over all connected paths. And geodesics are no longer only minimizer of the length functional, but also of the path energy. So if we want to approximate this, we don't have to approximate the length, we can approximate the energy, which is very helpful as you can see. So now we step from finite dimensions to infinite dimensions. Now we speak about physics. And uh, the remaining perspective to physical evolution processes. So now the Y here is a physical state of the system. I like a certain pose of shell surface, like a certain pose of an object, um, and uh, uh, we have um, tangent factors to these um, curves in the state of uh, physical states, and these tangent factors are nothing else but infinitesimal variations of the physical state. And the metric G now measures the cost to realize this infinitesimal variation. Now, for instance, if I bend a shell surface, so this is a perfect shell surface here, if I do this, uh, I basically transform um, energy into heat by dissipation, reflected by friction, and uh, the infinitesimal reply to a certain variation, this is measured by the metric by the metric G on infinite variations of physical states. Ah, here's another example. Think of the spoon which you bend uh, so that it doesn't uh, flip back. And uh, this is dissipation going on, and this is measured here by, uh, by the metric. And the path energy then represents the integrated cost of doing this, uh, this uh, change of state. Basically, the integrated cost over all the energy I invest in deforming and transferring energy to, uh, to heat. And geodesics are now, in this space of physical states, minimizers of the total cost to get from a state A, YA, to a state YB. So here are a couple of examples of uh, this type. So I start with something one-dimensional. Basically, look at this here, and just look for this uh, cross-section here. This is uh, a viscous rod, and uh, this viscous rod can undergo two different types of deformations. It can be tangentially stretched, or it can undergo normal bending. This is, uh, this is sketched over here. 
to gentle stretching and normal bending. And now, there is a response via this metric G to this. So if we look here for the derivative of the motion velocity, so if I just do a rigid body motion, huh, then I would like not to see any physical response, any energy spent for this. But uh, if I do an arc length derivative of the tangential velocity, then I see how much I change really the stretching in time. And this is the response to this tangential stretching. Normal bending comes along with the change of curvature. So if we measure the temporal change of curvature, then we measure the bending, the energy spent in bending. In the infinite in the sense, this is this energy. If delta is the thickness of this structure, we know that the membrane energy scales with delta and uh, the bending energy scales with the uh, delta Q. So this curvature term is rather complicated, highly nonlinear. We can simplify it. Our curvature is second derivatives by just computing the second derivatives uh, of the uh, of uh, the motion field, uh, pulling and pushing the viscous rock. And um, then we come to the next example. Now we step to one dimension higher to the space of viscous shells. Uh, so now this is really a viscous shell and uh, of thickness delta. And again, uh, we have uh, different modes of, uh, of variation. And we represent the shell by the mid layer, which I call S. And S delta is really the thick shell. And M denotes the space of all these shell representations by a mid surfaces. So if you consider our deformations, we have the same game, just in one dimension higher. We have tangential distortion. It's not only about stretching and uh, compression. It's also about shearing, which, I'm, which is very hard for me to show you. And we have, uh, again, normal bending. But now we have two curvatures. And there's really a shape operator changing um, via under normal bending. And both should be reflected in the, in the metric. And it's known, by work from the last decades, that uh, all this on this thick shell can be, up to higher order terms, reduced in terms of a rescaled energy uh, for deformations on the mid-surface. Now, this is work by Dre and Raoul for this membrane distortion by freezing to James Warren Müller by, uh, for the bending distortion. And uh, now how to get the metric? Our ansatz is now very simple. We follow Rayleigh's paradigm. We take an elastic energy and we just replace <coughs> displacements by or strains by strain rates. Huh? <coughs> and uh, uh, this elastic energy here should have two contributions. One scaled with delta is the membrane tangential distortion, and one scaled with delta cube is the bending distortion of the surface. In this case here, picking up standard elastic calculus, uh, this uh, Q tangential of this deformation phi is the Cauchy Green strain tensor tangential Cauchy Green strain tensor measuring tangential distortion. And the bending is a comparison of the two shape operators of the surface. Huh? So here is one shape operator representing this curvature. There is another shape operator <coughs> representing this. And basically, in the common frame, we just build the difference between the two. And then uh, there's a very nice result uh, by Benedict and Max. Uh, the question of this elastic energy, if uh, these two ingredients, W tangential and W bend are nicely chosen, 
is the nice property that uh, the Hessian only vanishes if the motion field uh, is an infinitesimal rigid <coughs> body motion, which we are not interested in. So that means this Hessian of this energy is a valid candidate for a metric on this base of viscous shells. And that's what we use. Huh? Let's get it by one half for normalization purposes. So, third example. This is now something you already have seen in the early beginning uh, in the teaser applications. So now we study viscous objects, uh, like these uh, biological sets. And these viscous objects, they flow. And uh, there is an Eulerian velocity, basically the flow field uh, fixed in time and not um, deforming with the flow, which represents this flow. Now well, that's the typical thing you can do with in computation fluid dynamics. Uh, there is uh, then a friction measure, and we suppose that our uh, liquid is uh, is uh, Newtonian, and then this friction measure basically measures through the trace of the symmetrized Radiant of the velocity, this is measuring uh, the change of volume infinitesimally. And uh, this term here measures the infinitesimal change of length. And then we can add longer term interaction by adding here a higher order derivative. This is a multipolar fluid model. And uh, now, how to use this to define the metric? Uh, metric is the cost we invest in this friction. And uh, how to do it? We take this quadratic form here, which measures this friction. We integrate it up over the object. Oh, then there are lots of object motions. Because it's about objects, these motions are all the same as long as their velocity component normal on the boundary is the same. So that means if you want to do it in an optimal way, this, this uh, spending of energy to heating up the fluid by friction, then we can minimize here overall velocity fields which have the same boundary distortion. And this is our metric on the space of uh, motion fields describing the motion of viscous objects. We are not talking about water. We are talking about uh, honey, <laughs> very viscous honey, to do really nice computations. And uh, this is closely linked to this theory of uh, the flow of diffeomorphism, uh, which uh, is uh, initiated by uh, Quinlander, uh, Dupree, Quinlander, and Miller. And uh, so, now this is about objects. Now here's the fourth example. Now we are in the space of images. Images have intensities. What we can do is, we can just transport intensities. This would be the flow of diffeomorphism approach, for instance. Or would be the optical transport approach, depending on the measure of uh, um, uh, with which we uh, measure the cost of doing uh, uh, flow. Uh, so here we are in this, uh, in this uh, viscous setup and in the flow of the diffeomorphism approach. But now, we do not want only to deform an image, we want to allow also for temporal changes of image intensities. But for sure, we should do it along motion paths. And uh, this can be done by the material derivative. There is here motion path x of t with the velocity which is equal to this Eulerian velocity field we discussed before then uh, we can compute here this material derivative and now we can define a cost, infinitesimal cost we can define our metric this now consists of two terms one is this term measuring the impact of the flow <coughs> this is this quadratic form we already had before and the second is now the material derivative the change of intensity is a long motion Surely they work together. A bad velocity field leads to very large material derivatives 
the perfect velocity field will have also a nice small material derivative, and this is balanced with this factor 1 over delta here. And uh, ah, so even though here is we define the metric of the variations of the image just in a very formal sense, uh, both terms depend on the motion field V e here via this equation for the material derivative which pops up here. This is called the metamorphosis model, and it was uh, proposed by uh, Tove and Tionis in uh, 2005 with nice existence theory. My topic is here basically an effective and converging uh, time discretization. So now we, short, we talk about uh, the shortest path. So let's think of a continuous geodesic. And for integers k here, we do an evaluation of the path um, at the distance of tau. And then we can study the path energy. And we observe a very fundamental inequality. This tau is here because our time interval is 0, 1, is 1 over k. And we have this inequality. This is an inequality we already have seen, seen on the whole interval 0, 1, now just on one time interval from time k times tau to k minus 1 times tau to time k times tau. Here is again this Cauchy Schwartz inequality. You put a 1 in here, then you use Cauchy Schwartz, and then you get here this contribution of the energy, and you get here the uh, length of this segment of the path squared. So if you minimize this, then you get the distance squared, and here that is an upper bound, this portion of the path energy. And as before, equality holds if we on the one hand have the minimizer and we have an arcane parameterization, as we have already seen before. So but if equality holds here for geodesics, then the object we have to approximate is to approximate the path energy and to approximate geodesics is uh, the distance square of two consecutive points on the path. And uh, this is now our approach for the uh, approximation of, um, of geodesic calculus as a whole and at first of uh, the path energy. Now, we suppose that there is a function w measuring the square distance between two states, y and y tilde, up to a higher order term. <coughs> and uh, then, with this function w, we can build up a discrete path energy, just on a family of discrete points in shape space, discrete physical states in shape space. And uh, what is important about this is, instead of really computing the remaining distance or approximating it directly and solving ODEs and all this, uh, this function can be much simpler and therefore computationally much more effective. And discrete geodesics are minimizers of this uh, energy. So here is the toy model case. Again, an embedded surface. And what you should think of in this embedded surface case, that uh, this, uh, this W here, uh, there is a two-dimensional surface, this pretzel surface in R3, and now the W is the Euclidean distance in R3 between two positions. Or in more physical terms, it is the spring energy stored in a spring connecting two consecutive positions here along this discrete path on the embedded surface. And for sure, if we go now closer and closer to one position on the embedded surface, this ambient distance will converge up to higher order terms to the embedded distance. And that's the property we need. And so instead of computing really some ODE, this is a very effective, very simple approximation of uh, this is a very simple approximation of uh, the path energy. Yeah. And again, what does this mean practically to be a geodesic? So if k, upper case k, 1 over tau, 
So then we can rewrite this energy that was a k up front, which is a 1 over tau. So we move the 1 over tau here, we compensate it by this, and then we see this rewriting of the discrete energy. But this is a discretization of the speed, and then we see that we get a discretization of the path energy immediately. So, how to solve this? How to solve this is to study the necessary condition um, for a discrete path to be minimizer of the discrete path energy. This is the discrete path energy. Every y j, or little k, appears for little k being 1 to uppercase k minus 1 two times. In this, uh, in this energy. Now, if we compute the necessary condition, we have to compute the derivatives of one term here where the y case is the second argument, and one w where the y case is the first one. And I use the simple abbreviation to identify these uh, derivatives. So this is derivative with the second, with respect to the second argument, with respect to the first argument. And then, if we do this for all of y case, then we get this system of uh, euler lagrange equations of necessary conditions for this discrete path to be a minimizing geodesic between the positions y0 and yk, which are fixed by boundary conditions. And all the red objects are degrees of freedom. The blue ones, which I hope you can identify, the not red ones are blue, yeah? Uh, they are fixed. And this is what you have to solve, for instance, by Newton's method. Here is on the embedded surfaces, two discrete geodesics. So one observation is, uh, um, why not to work with this discrete length? Uh, this would be a natural definition of the discrete length. W is the squared remaining distance approximation, so the square root is the distance approximation, summing up all the distances on consecutive points is a good approximation of the uh, length, or is equal to the length. So here is a very simple example. If you have a folding like this, and you want to connect this point with this point here, then the geodesic will look like this. And the minimizer of the discrete length function will always look like this. Huh? It's rather cheap just to step over here or even to stay here and then in one jump cross through the ambient space this, uh, this uh, folding and get the cheapest, uh, the cheapest cost. Now this is an artifact of this type of definition. This is not what we want. What's the reason for this? The reason for this is, as I initially said, this length function, the continuous and this discrete ones have linear growth. Huh? And, uh, this uh, leads to special solutions like this, and these are not solutions we want to see. So, uh, this does not lead to a useful definition. Let's stay with the energy. So here is now an approximation for the viscous rock case. So this term here, we have a deformed configuration. We have the undeformed one. This is the relative change of stretching. So if we compare this to one, this is a measure of the relative uh, uh, membrane distortion. And if we just compare the two second derivatives here, this is the difference in linearized curvatures. This is the approximation of uh, this. This is a rather simple quadratic energy, and uh, not in the highest order terms, quadratic, nonlinear in the lower order terms, uh, to approximate the right distance. Now, in case of viscous uh, shells, it's even simpler because with this procedure deriving our metric by our Rayleigh paradigms, we already have the elastic energy. Huh? This was the elastic energy. And now we just discretize it if we wanted to use triangle meshes using uh, nice technology developed over the last decade by, by various people also in this room here. And uh, we Used here an approximation of the membrane energy on triangles and on the bending energy on edges. And we sum it up and then we are in finite dimensions and we can solve by a Newton method uh, for discrete geodesics. 
So here are, from a rather old paper already, results of this uh, space of, uh, and now the space of discrete disk shells. And for two different thickness parameters, we see discrete geodesics. If delta is rather small, thickness is very small, then we see mostly the impact of the membrane energy. And the membrane energy tries to have deformations which are as isometric as possible. And what you see here is cheaper to stretch a little bit the outer ring and then to more, more or less isometrically push it through instead of using strong bending modes as you see for larger values of data. You see high concentration, basically automatic detection of uh, joints in both energies. If you look for different uh, discrete paths. <coughs> so, what to do with viscous objects? Uh, now we basically do an inverse step of this Rayleigh paradigm. We have this uh, Newtonian friction here. And we now ask for a deformation energy which, uh, uh, which would give us back, if we apply a Rayleigh paradigm, uh, this Newtonian friction. And this is basically what we do. We study an elastic energy, those second order expansion, ah, here's the Hessian of this W, basically gives us back these terms, which here look a little bit different, but they are the same, which, which gave us this definition of the L operator. Ah, and any paradigm will give us an approximation of the uh, local square remaining distance. And you've already seen this application. Here's an application in 3D, two poses and a geodesic path, a short one connecting these poses. And you see here by the slicing, we have really internal volumetric uh, friction appearing here in the caracol. So now what to do with the, um, with the space of images under the metamorphosis model? Let me recall. The metamorphosis model combines measuring friction by a flow and letting the image flow and uh, um, counting the material derivative, integrating the material derivative of the uh, change of intensities. And these are the two terms here, and this is the path energy. Now, how to approximate this locally in time? Now, we already know these two terms approximate, are they are the same as in this viscous object case, they approximate uh, the Newtonian uh, um, flow part. And this simple term, you all know if you once have done something on, or read something on, on image registration, this is the most basic fidelity term in image matching. We have two image intensities, and we ask for a deformation such that the L2 distance of a transferred in, transformed image and the undeformed in, uh, reference image is as small as possible. So this function here is something which is very well known from image registration. If you look closer to this term, what is this here? This is a small displacement, basically reflecting a time step of the flow, and then we compare at the deformed position this u tilde and the, with the u at the undeformed position, and these are two consecutive images along a sequence. So this is nothing else but the difference quotient for the material derivative in time. This term here, very natural, and. Uh, this is a sketch down here from two consecutive images, deformation, and this friction term, and this intensity change term. And then we can add them up and get our, sorry, here's a superficial K, we should skip our discrete path energy. And here is one application. These are two fe female portraits, and we see the geodesic with the uh, K plus one, uh, 17, 17 uh, single images, 
and these are the corresponding parameters. And, uh, we use this geodesic now animated. And what you see here now is over time for varying numbers of intermediate objects, images, in red, this Newtonian flow term, friction measurement, and in green, the change of, um, of intensity via the discrete material, discrete uh, material derivative. And you see, you see some balancing of, um, of these terms already in the early stage of this refinement process. And this somehow reflects a property of the discrete uh, uh, path energy that minimizes lead to some equidistribution of energy. This is a continuous case known as the Eichmann parameterization of geodesics, which are minimizers of the path energy. Here we see the discrete counterpart. Now here you see in color space for the intensities this uh, transition of uh, one for Gogh portrait to another one. And I'm cheating a little bit. With the original RGB image, it was too high to do it. So what we did, because uh, the method was unable to detect basically the ear, here and here, and uh, um, the clothing, it's the separation of the clothing from the skin. <coughs> so we did a segmentation, did a segmentation of uh, these two objects for the first of the last image. We add a fourth color channel, which basically was the channel of this segmentation, and we let it flow as well. Here you see the motion field generating this flow. And here you see now pulled back and integrated in time the accumulated material derivative, which is called here Z. So we see almost no material derivative at the end. And here is all the color change integrated onto one image. And what you can also do is uh, here are these two input images. Once you have the discrete geodesic and all the transport, you can uh, basically uh, um, pull back this color information onto this geometry and use it uh, for texturing. Now here you see this texture on this geometry. So now this is all about shortest paths, but there is more to do than just shortest paths. Shortest paths. There is extrapolation, there is power transport, detail transport. Let's come to this. First, let's look for the continuous case. So here is the Lagrange equation of the geodesic in the continuous case. How to compute this? Basically, we compute the variation of the position of the curve. Now, this is this theta here. This is the variation of the curve. And now we have to differentiate with respect to this variation parameter epsilon. There are three positions where you see epsilon. So there are three terms via the chain of the total derivative. One term is simple, or two terms are basically simple because this epsilon here and this epsilon here, the g is quadratic in its arguments, so this is just differentiation in quadratic form. This is what you see here, two symmetric quadratic form, two g y, y dot, theta dot. And then we have to differentiate here. This is differentiating with respect to the seat position. Now, then you have to differentiate by the chain where you get this Jacobian of the metric with respect to the seat position, and you keep the arguments of the quadratic form. Now, here is basically a quadratic form where we have two derivatives of y. Now we can use integration by parts. Now, moving this. Dot over here, 
Then we get two terms. One is really differentiating this term here. And one is really the partial integration leaving, <coughs> putting, the, pushing the dot over this is this term. And then we see this. And here now we have no derivatives any longer on the test functions. So we can get this pointwise almost everywhere. And uh, if we collect these terms, they are known to be the Gustafs. The Gustav operator is very infinite dimensions. And this is the ODE, possibly in infinite dimensions, uh, for initial data position and velocity, uh, which allows us uh, to describe shooter geodesic. How to do it this way? It's much more simple. Here is how it works. This, you already have seen. this is what you already have seen. This is the euler Lagrange system, the system of Lagrange equations of the abbreviation of geodesic with prescribed y0 and y upper k, upper k. And all the rad entries are degrees of freedom, everything is coupled. Now we do it differently. Now we start with one position, then we have a first position also given, because the, dis the, the vector between these two is the discrete initial velocity. So we have now one, 0 and one, 1 given. And then we can study this equation here as an equation with unknown y2. It has to be studied whether this is solvable, a uh, couple of arguments to prove this, at least if uh, y1 is not too far from y0, one can in a certain set of proof. Uh, solving this nonlinear equation, we get y2. Then we jump into the second equation. Uh, y1 is given, y2 is now given, and y3 is the unknown. Uh, now we get goes one step further, again solving a nonlinear system, and so on. And basically, uh, y0, y1, initial discrete velocity, now we compute y2, given y1 and y2, we compute y3, and so on until we get to yk, minus 1, and yk minus 2, and from this we can compute then yk. Ah, so this is discrete shooting, much simpler because we are in this discrete world. <coughs> and here are results now on the space of discrete discrete shirts. Ah, so this is a relational <coughs> geodesic. This is now the shooting of the discrete geodesic. Ah, this x with this upper index is the number, the upper index is the number of steps of this discrete evolution, and if we compute the difference, then we see we are fairly close. And this is first order consistency of our approximation, and we can even go further, uh, beyond the various initiatives. And we can use this for animating. If we start with one of the uh, uh, non-trivial principal modes of the Hessian of the deformation energy, uh, then we get these extrapolated motion patterns. And uh, if we look for this forward and backward geodesic, given this, uh, given this uh, uh, mode of variation, and if we study here uh, the, um, uh, the W functional, which is the rate of dissipation, then we see it's up to first order constant, which is perfect. Huh? discrete icon parametrization of geodesics. And here you see in the space of viscous objects a um, variation geodesic given this input and this end object and here is the extrapolated image, almost the same. Here are two that set images from another part of this image sequence, <coughs> slides Displacement, which you can you can compute, extrapolate the perspective motion, and doing push forward to uh, cover it. And this is what you already have seen. You can do it also. There are a lot of details. I'm not going to dig into this 
and in the space of metamorphosis image model. So you can start with the first two images of this portrait sequence, and you basically get very far. You get not to the last image of this 16 image sequence, but you get to the uh, titled image. And what you see here is now in red and blue coloring the um, negative and the positive um, uh, intensity changes along motion paths. So now let's get to finally transfer of geometric variations, or in geometric terms, parallel transport. Parallel transport needs the covariant derivative gives you the simplest explanation. On an embedded surface, we do nothing else but uh, we have a vector field. On the surface, along the curve, we compute the derivative of this vector field. This might have components in normal direction and tangential components, and we only use the tangential components. Yeah? And uh, the means here is the vector field, tangential, then we can compute y dot, which might have uh, component normal and the projected, this is the right covariant derivative. This, in this case, can be phrased using the Christoffel operator as such, and this representation of this covariant derivative no longer requires embedding. Uh, so we can use this also in infinite dimensional <coughs> manifolds. And uh, uh, here is how it is defined. Uh, before, these were only two terms, but uh, this is because uh, two of these terms, these two were equal in our previous use of the covariant derivative. So a vector field is called parallel if there is no tangential contribution to the variation of the vector field. And uh, if a W field is parallel along a geodesic, then we can use this Riemann equality, which I'm not explaining here. Um, if we differentiate here the angle between the velocity direction of the geodesic and vector field, then we see we can use the product rule. This is zero because it's parallel. This is zero because the, the motion field of the geodesic is parallel. So this is all zero. That means the angle along a geodesic of a parallel vector field does not change. How to discretize this? <coughs> Let's consider it parallel transport in R2 along geodesics. Geodesics in R2 are straight lines. So here is the geodesic. And here is the parallel transport. Parallel transport can be easily done by constructing a parallel path. This is the vector I would like to transport. I would like to transport it up to here. Then I draw this diagonal, I compute the center, and I know that for parallelograms, the diagonals meet at the center. So then I shoot a geodesic a straight line through this center point, travel the same distance, and then I get the end point here. This is the parallelogram construction. I already use terms which easily can be transferred to the remaining setup. Here's a Riemannian discrete parallel transport, and this is uh, what has been invented in uh, gravitational physics, and uh, is uh, by a child, and it's called child Weiler. So basically, here we have a velocity field which gives rise to this geodesic arc. Once we have this geodesic arc, we compute this geodesic arc. Then we take the center. Then we connect this by a geodesic arc. We use extrapolation to go twice as far. Then we compute the geodesic here. And then we do this iteratively step by step along the ladder. Now, this is just replacing our straight lines from here by geodesics, nothing else. And now how to discretize it? Yeah. We just replace these geodesic arcs by displacements and now, this is a discrete vector field. Then we compute a three-point geodesic. Then we, sh we use this here to compute a three-point geodesic by shooting. Then we get the next position, and so on. Three-point geodesic, 
three-point geodesic shooting, three-point geodesic, three-point geodesic shooting, and so on. And this is our discrete transport of this discrete factor here to this discrete factor there. I now mark here all these points, and what we see basically is what do we expect. We expect as necessary conditions the other Lagrange equations for these <coughs> variation geodesics and this shooter geodesics, and here they are. And by this we can build parallel transport. And you already have seen this application. This is parallel transport of these uh, serif details here of the letters from P to A. This is parallel transport of small geometric deformations of this uh, uh, viscous object with the shape of a dog along the curve. And uh, finally, and then we make this very brief. What we can also do is we can do um, um, we can compute splines on Riemannian manifolds. <coughs> splines are in the Euclidean case known as minimizers of this energy by the Bohr, and uh, uh, with given support points, and we can transfer this this energy here to get visually appealing, smooth interpolation of keyframes, adaptive compression of dense sequences of shapes by looking at this energy here. Here are the material derivatives of the motion velocities. This is the counterpart of the second derivatives in the Euclidean case. And uh, for the disquisition, I would like to give a link to Ben Thierry's talk tomorrow morning. And then we finally, very brief, in 20 seconds, report on the mathematical rigor in all this. So for this uh, geodesic calculus consisting of discrete geodesics, exponential depth, logarithm, which I haven't explained, and power transport, we have in infinite dimension Hilbert spaces, comprehensive convergence theory, that everything is converging of first order. We have uh, the metamorphosis model that uh, the discrete geodesic is converging to the continuous geodesic because the energy functions are so called gamma converging. And uh, furthermore, we know that at least there exists a discrete exponential map in this uh, continuous setup of the metamorphosis model. And finally, uh, we have discrete splines, existence, and gamma convergence of discrete splines uh, in finite dimensional Thanks for your attention.